Is there still trouble with Robert Anucci? Well, I would think as long as you're alive <laughs> and you've had trouble with him, it's possible they could something could come out of the woodwork. Really? I'm sure of that. So, but he, in the moment, it's it's calm. Well, he probably doesn't know where I live, and he probably doesn't know my telephone number. Although he he could quite easily find out if he wanted to. I see. But before you before you leave here, I want to show you a copy of the court document mm -hmm. on what they found me guilty of. I would like to see that. Yeah. I'd like to give you a copy and maybe, you know, have we, it published. Yeah, we will do that. Because yeah. that proves to, to everybody what a liar he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah. I would appreciate it. Mm. Um, do you still have contact to the people of the old Grand Prix scenery? And to whom do you have contact regularly? I don't, I don't have regular contact. No, um, you know, now and again I might find Kenny, and if he wants to talk to me or he wants to talk, okay. But you know, many times it's like he's not here. Kenny Roberts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's not very many of the old people left now. Mm -hmm. uh, Firenze Finale with Yamaha's. Um, he's, I, I think, one of the last guys that worked on MVs and then carried on work. Other than that, I don't think there's too many mechanics. How about Kel Carruthers? Isn't he a friend of yours? Yeah. He works in California. And I don't think he works in racing anymore. He has his own shop? No. He works for... Um, uh, what is the name? Chaparral. Ah, the, 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 the racing car? No. Chaparelli motorcycle dealers in California. I see. Um, quite loud here. <laughs> How long did you work for the Honda Motor Company? From 1963 until 1968. Like, Only for Honda? In that time, yes. And you were a Honda employee in those days? Yes. Like all the other mechanics, no difference? No, no difference. Um, how did you get the job at Honda Company? Um, when, <coughs> in nine, uh, Redmond was looking for a mechanic, and Redmond lived near me in Rhodesia. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, he said, can you come and work for me? And uh, which I said, yes, you know. And it was an opportunity which I had to take. So you, you entered the Grand Prix scenery, and from the spot on you were employee for him. Yeah, but previous to that, I, was, um, I helped Gary Hockey when he was with um, MB Augusta from 1960 to 1960, halfway between 61 and uh, 62. And then you went back to Rhodesia? No, I went to Zambia for six months in at the end of 1963 mm -hmm. and worked on the copper mines. Really? Yeah. In in the mines, the heavy heavy work? No, I, I was in ventilation I see. section. Um, what did you do at Honda Motor Company during the winter time? We used to carry on developing the previous uh, the previous year's engines and also rebuilding or building new engines and testing them. Um, and if they were no good, then they had to start again. And, and, uh, Is it true that Honda destroyed racing machines after the season? Yes. <coughs> yeah. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. How, how, how did they do that? With the big hammer? Or did they yeah, just guys just with a hammer and just destroyed them. Really? Yeah. It's amazing. They didn't, I mean, they probably kept one or two. But uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't keep all of the bikes. 
and the spare parts? The spare parts that they could use, they kept, like levers, brake ca uh, cables, um, wheel rims, that sort of stuff they kept. Mm -hmm. But anything else that wasn't going to be used in the new engine was out. And how did that work? Did Mr. Honda came and said break it or destroy it or was, it a, was there a day of destruction or? <laughs> no. It, um, but Japanese thinking was next year is a new year, so we start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. We don't start from last year. I see. So whatever had to be destroyed was automatically destroyed, and then we started again. Very expensive, but the results are another. They tell another story. Yeah because they never, you know, you can only have one winner, but every year the Japanese just went better and better and better and better. Mm -hmm. You know, they never went backwards, backwards, backwards. You have one year where Suzuki's dominated 125 class. The next year Honda's dominated it. The next year Yamaha's dominated it. May I ask how much money you earned at Honda Motor Company in those days? In those days, I think, 15 pound a week. So 60 a month? Yeah. One pound was 11 marks in those days, right? Mm, yeah. Maybe more. 10, 10 or 11. No, I don't think I don't think that much more. So not too much? No. But um, they paid all the flights and, 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 and when you were overseas they paid everything? They, mm, yes, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, what was your main job during those days at Honda Motor Company? Well, we used to, <coughs> every one of us had to be able to work on all the classes. Like you had to work on a, be able to work on a 50, a 125, 250, 350, 500. But you had one main class that you used to look after, only one bike in a class. Mm -hmm. and. So basically, I worked on 250s. And then, you know, if there was a lot of work to do on the 50s, then everybody helped with the 50s. Mm -hmm. And at the end of practice, we used to have a, a system where <coughs> you had all the classes. When the 50 class was, all that work was finished, then you move to the next class, and the next class, and the next class. All the guys, yes. the whole team. Right. Until all the work was finished. And you never went to bed before all the work was finished. You mean in, you mean uh, during the time on the racetrack, but also in the factory? No, in the factory, we used to, the 50 guys would solely work on 50s. I see. And that, and no, they would, then you were split up basically. Mm -hmm. How was the <coughs> structure of, of the racing team? Was there most of the, of the work, was it, was it teamwork or was it a kind of uh, one boss after the other so that, that uh, you had a kind of hierarchy as we say in German? No, we used to have uh, like an engineer and a chief mechanic and um, you know huh? Um, the chief mechanic was, was good, I think very good. I think the development engineers were also very good. They, <coughs> Hondas were always very strict, like you had to work properly, you know. There was no like cutting corners or anything like that. It was, you know, we're going to race, we're going to win. It was none of this, well, you know, maybe we'll win tomorrow or maybe next week. It was never a maybe. Always it straight. It was straight. Nice. And that was where I think they were so much stronger than anybody when they came racing. Because if you had to work for three days without going to bed, you worked for three days. And nobody said, oh, I'm feeling tired. Nobody. Nobody. 
and I was like the, uh, the the chief mechanic would say, guys, we're working tonight. It was like a light switch mm -hmm. is switched on, and it stayed on until the work was finished. I see. So. But it was was good work. It, you you liked your, your work in those days. Yeah. And uh, you had friendship with the other colleagues. Oh, yeah. And you had a, had a nice team. Mm. Yeah. So my, my next question is a few pages further on, but it, it, it fits now uh, perfect. Mm. So what what happened after after winning a race? Was there always a party or only a, a little zip of beer and then work again? No, most times, most times we would, if there was a problem with one of the bikes, yeah. it was stripped down immediately to find out what the problem was. Sometimes the whole engine? Oh, yes. And then um, the results, like the, the chief mechanic would say, oh, I think, yeah, it's, that's the problem there. He would phone Japan immediately and say, look, we had a bit of a problem on this bike this rider, you know, we need we need something done about it. I see. And, uh, and then we would have dinner together mm -hmm. and we'd, we'd probably have a, a drink, but not, uh, I wouldn't say a, a real big um, celebration. On the Isle of Man, a little bit different, you know. Mm -hmm. um, at dinner we'd probably you know, maybe have two or three drinks. I see. Uh, but after winning a world championship, what happened then? Was there a gift from the rider or from the company or a big party? What 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 happened? No, we n we never had parties. I mean, they would uh, it, sit down and have dinner and like they would say thank you and mm -hmm. and that. Um, the riders. Um, Mike Harewood always gave one of the mechanics a trophy. Really? Yes, every you mechanic. Mean, you mean after the race? Yeah. If he won a race, which he won a lot of races, he would give a trophy to one of the mechanics. The trophy or a trophy? No, no. The winning trophy. The winning trophy, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Always did that. And he would always have dinner with us. And he would pay for the dinner. Yeah. yeah. And that was m one of the reasons why you liked him so much. Well, I think so. And he was, we knew that by himself, when he came to Honda's, when he sat on a bike, it was 20 horsepower more. Because there's no way that Redmond could have beaten Phil Reed on the six cylinder. Really? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. In 65, we had the six cylinder, and Jim didn't win the championship. Phil Reed won it. And the next year, next year we Mike had Mike, took over. and he won every race. So he he gave through his um, ability, he gave the bike the, the the real horsepower it really needs. Right. Yeah. He he was a winning factor. I think so. Yeah. But what what kind of person was uh, was Michael? What else? I mean, was he a, was he a, a, a friendly friendly guy and, and nice and, and funny? Yeah, yeah, I think I think so. <coughs> I mean, you know, for an example, in 60, 66, 67, when he won the five hundred uh, race on the Isle of Man, yes, he gave the guy, the mechanic who looked after the 500s, after the race he gave him a bottle of whiskey. And uh, this guy liked whiskey. So we got back to the hotel and, you know, we were, let's face it, it was one of those races where it could have been Agostini or could have been Aga, you know, mm -hmm. when Agostini oh broke the chain. Mm -hmm. And um, we got back to the hotel there. We had a couple of drinks before dinner. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the guy from the 500, he got into the bath and like put the plug in, mm -hmm. turned the water on, opened the bottle of whiskey, got in there <laughs> and was drinking away, drinking away. <laughs> and 
the dining room yes. was below the mm -hmm. bedrooms and it was a wooden floor. Yes. So this guy goes to sleep in the bath holding his whiskey and the water goes over the edge <laughs> and, and fills up the bathroom <laughs> and then starts leaking through into the dining room. <laughs> so, somebody goes up there, bangs on the door, goes in and there he is, lying in the bath with his cap on, holding his bottle of whiskey, and, and like six inches of water on the, <laughs> on the floor. Oh, terrible. And, you know, Mike had a, he just laughed about it. And, uh, you know, said, oh, wow. There, there was an, an, an incident, another incident you, you mentioned uh, some times ago. You, you said that uh, Mike Hill didn't like the strict Honda rules as a rider when, when for example, you were at Bruno. What, what happened when the Honda guys told you to be there early in the morning on Sunday before the race? That, that, one, um, that, one, race, ra that one race meeting, well, Mike, we were having dinner. Mm -hmm. Mike said to me, let's go to the nightclub. And this was 66, I think. Yeah, I think 66. So we go to the nightclub and um, we meet three Austrian girls, <laughs> and Mike has a bottle of vodka. Saturday night, I have a bottle of vodka, and the next morning we, you know, get to the circuit. Mm -hmm. Man, I didn't know where I was, whether I was <laughs> on the moon or Mars <laughs> or where. And Mike? And Mike, pitch, he arrives, and he wins three races that day. <laughs> And, uh, and he said to me, he said, man, that was hard. <laughs> but how many guys could drink a bottle of vodka on a Saturday night and win three Grand Prix? <laughs> how many? Not too many. I, I don't think, think too many. <laughs> oh. um, would you please tell us something about the Honda 6? Um, do you know how many machines and engines um, has been built? For the Honda 6. Mm. Do you have an idea? Because in that magazine you have, they, they say that there are only three left or so. No, no, there is more than three left. Um, there's the one that Iannucci's got, that's the first one. Where, where is that bike now? That's in California. Still? Yeah. No pay, no get. <laughs> <laughs> there's that one. There's. Um, there's two 297s, the 297s. Mm -hmm. There's... They are at, at, at the Honda Museum? Yeah. Two of them? Yeah. There's an RC-166, which is the one that Hale would run the World Championship on. And there's an RC-160... Is that in Holland? No. No, that's, a, that's another 166. Which is really existing yeah you have seen that no no but you you know that's there yeah with a dutch guy right um the 1965 honda which was the rc 165 that in europe didn't have oil coolers mm -hmm. in, at the japanese grand prix it had oil coolers on it so the bottom half of the engine was modified for the oil coolers. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have any of the 165s. They've probably destroyed. So how, how many has ha, have been built? What do you think? Oh, I think it was probably uh, two or six. Eight, nine. There's probably like 12 built altogether. Three and two fifty. Yes. For each. No, just twelve complete. Six uh, cylinders. Yeah. And with spare engines? Uh, no, maybe there was like four spare engines. Did you destroy the six cylinder by yourself? No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think by then Hondas realized that they were so good that they had to keep them. Um, was it very difficult to prepare the bikes for for a race? I, I don't really think so. It was, if you put them together right, mm -hmm. and everything was correct, 
you knew you didn't have to open them again. You know, like they would do practice or training and the race. Mm -hmm. You knew they were going to be good. But you had, to, we were all, also, we had to prepare a bike in a certain time. Mm -hmm. Like they would say at a Grand Prix, you have to prepare a bike from stripping the engine down to building it up and putting it back in the frame in like eight hours. And you try to make it eight hours. You mean after every race you disassembled yeah. every six cylinder? Yeah. yeah. And looked after all the parts yeah. and put it together? Yeah. Every every race bike. That is what we used to do. So how long did it take for you to uh, put one engine together when it was apart? About six hours. Blind? Yeah, no, you can't put them together blind <laughs> because you have to, you know, look at them and make sure that everything is right. But your aim, and that was, uh, it's like a 50 twin, it was like four hours, pull it mm -hmm. down, open it up, change the crank, change the valves, pistons, rings, and all that, and in four hours time. Did Honda change some parts during the, the season? Oh, yes. <coughs> Many times. Really? Yeah. And um, what was the most fragile part of the bike? Mm. To be honest, I don't think there was any real fragile part, providing if they said to you the crankshaft is good for 800 kilometers, it was good for 800. If you went 850, you were in trouble. Really? Yeah. And like the pistons, if they said 500 kilometers, it was 500 kilometers. So did that mean that, that you always put in a, a new crank or did you... Um, re rebuilt the, the crank in a no, certain the way. The cranks were always sent back to Japan and rebuilt there. I see. <coughs> During the, the season, many times. Yes. Um, what do you think about George Beale's Honda Six replicas? Well, it's a it's a real expensive motorcycle, and you know, are you going to buy or pay so much money for a replica? I don't think that in the world today that people would, would want to buy a replica for that much money. It makes nice music, but can he guarantee it's going to run for a thousand miles don't or a thousand so. kilometers? I don't think so. Do you speak Japanese language? I used to be able to speak it. Pretty well. Pretty well. I, I would say, yeah, when I say pretty well, I would say quite well. Don't forget. Oh, it's, <laughs> getting, it's getting old, is it? <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Um, Do but, you? Yes. But you know, with all, I think with all languages, I tend to forget them a little bit. How many languages do you do you speak fairly well? I used to be able to speak Dutch, Italian, Japanese, German, and a little and bit of yeah. German. Yeah, a little bit of Swedish, a little bit of Finnish. And a very little bit of Czech, but I think that the Czech I I've forgotten. I see. Um, did you ever meet Mr. Honda? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. What kind of person has he been? <coughs> I think I think a good a good person. I think some a person very similar to uh, Enzo Ferrari. Really? 
Yes, maybe Mr. Honda was more more of an engineer than Enzo Ferrari. But I think when you look at them and their results, they both were trying to do something. And the odds against them doing it were, there was always odds against them. But they just carried on and carried on and carried on until they Against succeeded. all odds. Well, yeah, he, but I also think old man Honda probably also lost. At times, you know, mm -hmm. but you know, you have to admire them for like starting from nothing and becoming in the world Ferrari. You can go and ask an Eskimo, you can show him a Ferrari badge, and he knows, man, that's Ferrari, mm -hmm. or same as Honda today. Who was your best friend during your time as a racing mechanic? I mean, not only in the Honda days, but but all over the years. Who who was your the the, the best best friend of you? Mm. A rider or another mechanic? I mean, you you sometimes say this is my best friend or so. Did you have this best friend in that no, scenery? No, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. I was. To me, it was like what counted most was the team, that everybody sort of worked well together. Because it's like the Yamahas were very, very um, strict about team uh, and human relationship. If there was somebody in there that didn't fit in the team, then he wasn't in the team. Really? Yeah. And I think Yamaha has had some really, really good teams. Maybe not result-wise as good as Honda, mm -hmm. but human relationship-wise, so much better. I see. You know. Do you remember any funny incident during your time at, at Honda? Well, I think a funny time, and this was like, we were going to Nürburgring in 60, and we used to have, you know, three trucks, Opel Blitz trucks, <laughs> and a Ford um, Taunus mm -hmm. station wagon. And so we leave Amsterdam, and we're going on, going on, going on. And um, we come to Nürburgring, to the tunnel, and they go past. So I think, of, man, what's going on? So get the van, get up front, go off. They all come off. Where are you going? Yeah, we're going to no, we're going to Nürburgring. So, well, where? Show me. They mistake. They made a mistake with Nuremberg ah. and Nürburgring. And I'm saying, hey man, we got to do a U-turn because it's back. Mm -hmm. And they saying, yeah. <laughs> and but that was, you know, just one of those crazy <laughs> incidents where... You, you once mentioned that, that with that tool list you always had to, to write down because the inventory when you crossed the border to, to East, Ger oh. East Europe. Well, the, the, you mean the, the, the worst place was going into Italy. Really? Yeah. Because they'd say, okay, let's have a look at the list of spare parts. Ah, 306 millimeter washers. Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> Count them. One, two, three, four, 260, 70. Really? 82. Not correct. So, well, hey, we used them. Yeah, but here it says 300 and you've only got 282. And they would drive you crazy. Absolutely crazy. Maybe you for, forgot to pay them something under the table. Man, I wouldn't pay them. I wouldn't even pay them with a dog. They used to make <laughs> me so angry. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so which racetrack did you like most? I liked quite a, quite a lot of racetracks. I liked Nürburgring, Isle of Man. Uh, um, what was the other one? In Bruno. Uh, Bruno. And... Um, 
the one in France. Um, Not Paul Ricard, the other one. Uh, the old one. Le Mans, uh, no, not Le Mans. No, no. Oh, uh, Clément Ferrand. Clément Ferrand. That was nice? Yeah, because they weren't horsepower circuits. The rider had to do some work and learn the circuit mm -hmm. and then win. And if you didn't learn the circuit, you didn't win. And you didn't need the fastest bike to win. I see. And I think when a rider won like at Nürburgring, mm -hmm. he really won a race. It wasn't on a Mickey Mouse circuit where he could stand up and say, oh man, I won a race. At Nürburgring he was going, man, that was hard. I heard that Kenny Roberts, when he first appeared at the Nürburgring, he did very well. After a few laps he knew every curve and he had a new lap record, is that right? I don't know, I don't know. He, Virginia Ferrari got the lap record that year. But Kenny went out in a, somebody lent him a Porsche mm -hmm. and he learned the circuit in that. I see. But the best one was the year that I worked for Kanaga. Mm -hmm. Did you Kanaga? Yeah. We went to Nürburgring and I said to him, I'll work on the bikes. And we had a Hertz renter van. Mm -hmm. I said to him, man, go and learn the circuit. <laughs> With the Hertz. <laughs> With a Hertz renter van. And which wouldn't even do. 100 kilometers an hour. Um, a, um, a truck or a, a, a van or what was it? A van. A van. So he went with a van on the truck? Yep. He did like, I think, 40 laps. And the tires were finished, huh? But he won the race. Really? Yeah. And there was Rodney Brewer there. There was all the big big shots there. And I said, oh man, I don't know how he could win a race. I said, yeah. You knew how, huh? Yeah. So it was your ad advice, which... Yeah, I said to him, hey, you know, yeah, you can win, man. You go out and you learn that circuit so good that when Rodney and all of them come here, you don't worry about them and they're talking and, you know, chirping and that. <coughs> Get on the bike and go. Fine. And Sarenen was there. And Sarenen, I think, was near the front at one stage. And Kanaya didn't go super fast, but he went fast everywhere. Because he knew how the curves were. Right. And, uh, <coughs> I think Jano finished third, but he won. And uh, I thought, hmm. Which rider did impress you most during your entire career? I think Mike and I think Kenny. And then with Kenny, because he learned circuits so quickly, and he would, he was so, such a strong person in the team. You know, he wasn't one of these guys who would go out and say, ah, oh, man, the bike's no good, and blah, 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 blah. You know, and go out, he'd say to him, you know, is the bike going good? Yeah, it's not too bad. Not too bad. Can you go quicker? Sure. Tomorrow I'll go quicker. And, and he would do that. Mm -hmm. So he helped you to improve a bike on the weekend? Yeah. He could give you good hints? Yeah. And how about, how about Mike? I, Mike? I I heard that he was even faster than a bad bike. He, Mike, you know, he, if, if the bike was, wasn't good, he would say, don't worry about it. Um, I'll be all right. And, and uh, it's because he had so much talent. Mm -hmm. I don't think Kenny had as much talent as Mike mm -hmm. because Kenny was more of a fighter mm -hmm. than Mike. Mike could, you know, he knew th where his limit was and he, he knew how far over the limit he could go. Kenny could go straight to the limit mm -hmm. and then there was no more. I see. You know. So when I ask you who was in your mind the very best, what would you say then? I would, I would have to say Mike, mm -hmm. because he could win on a 50, a 125, a 250, a 350, and a 500, 650, 750. Whatever. Yeah. And even on a Harley Davidson. Right? Well, I don't even, I, I don't think he ever rode one, but I mean, <laughs> he, you know. He would walk then. Yeah. 
um, you know, people have said, oh, I mean, Phil Reed, is, Phil Reed was better. But Phil Reed never won a 50cc race. Mm -hmm. He might have won 125 and 250, 350, 500. <coughs> but, you know, like riding four classes in a day or five classes in a day, I don't think Phil ever, never did that. And in England, like Mike would ride five classes in a day and win, and win all five. <laughs> um, so, what is your personal ranking of the of the best five riders of all time you have been in that scenery? What what do you think? I mean, first would be Halewood, that's clear. Yeah. What do you think? Who's who's second? I would have to say um, Ubiali. Really? Yeah. I think he was he was a a great lightweight rider. I think Tiberi was another great rider, mm -hmm. good technical rider. Mm -hmm. I would say Redman. And Phil? Yeah, yeah. He, well he, <coughs> he at least got Yamaha's going. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, as a character, he's probably, you know, he probably doesn't even come in the top 100. Really? But as a rider, Mm -hmm. Then I think maybe, you know, he's, he was a good rider, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Argo, to a degree, because he had no opposition for so long, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and a lot of people don't even rate him. Really? Yeah. Not even in the, in the top 50. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because they say, hey, who did he beat? Guys on Norton's, that was it. And how about Sarino? Yeah, no, he was good, but you know, he's like, he's like uh, Gilles Villeneuve. You know, they didn't win a lot of races. They, they died too far too early. Right? Yeah. But I, you know, Yano, I think, in that day that he was killed, I think it was more bad luck than him making a mistake. That oil. Yeah, I mean, I we heard from the court that they said that Harley Davidson of Pasolini's had seized, but I know the engineers from Yamaha's. They said there was nothing wrong with those two bikes. There nothing. was oil from the race before. Yeah, from the Benelli. And the officials were too lazy to to let the oil to go out and, and clean, clean it, it up. Yeah. Do you know anything about that dispute between Yamaha, Phil Reed and Bill Ivey? Have you read? Oh yeah, a lot. What 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 do you think <laughs> about what do you think about that? I mean, uh, I heard different stories. I heard the story of Barry Brower. He told me that uh, Phil did wrong, and I asked Phil, and he said uh, that he heard that Yamaha would stop anyway, so he didn't know why he shouldn't be a world champion. <coughs> well. I mean, that's typical of Phil Reed. In the beginning of the year, Bill Ivey signed a contract with Yamaha to win 125 and 250. Really? Yes. <coughs> and that was before Suzuki and, Yam and Honda's had withdrawn from racing. Mm -hmm. When they found out about it, <coughs> they said to Bill, look, you know, Hondas are not going to be around, and neither is Suzuki. So, we would like you to choose which world championship you'd like to win. 250 or 125. And he said, I've won the 125 once, I'd like the 250. They said, fine. He signed his contract to win the 250, and Phil signed the contract to win the 125. He signed the contract. Yes. He signed it. Did, did, did he sign also that he's not going to win the 250? Do you know that? Only he, his contract was to only win the one two five. Only. Yeah. <coughs> so he got paid for that contract. Yeah. But the guy that was working for Phil was another snake. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who was it? Uh, Roy Robinson. Mm -hmm. Roy would go to Bill and say to Bill, "Look, I need um, pistons. We've run out of pistons." And Bill would say, yeah, there we are, four pistons, cranks, there it is. 
if we give it so there were two different workstations. Yeah. With each have had their own mechanics. Our mechanics and their, and their own, own parts. Spares, yeah. So they had nothing in common. Right. Just the the sign of Yamaha. Right. And even their own uh, vans, right. even their own tents, everything mm -hmm. was separate. Right. So eventually, in the end, Bill didn't have any spare parts because they'd given them all to Bill. Really? Then, when Bill wanted spare parts, and he went to Phil. The snake didn't give it. Said, they gone, finished. So, Bill's saying, hey man, I, gave, I lent you this, I lent you that, and you haven't returned anything. And he said, well, can't help it, I've used everything. And Yamaha said, look, it's up to you to sort this lot out. And Bill, this is what made Bill so mad about it, was Phil just said, hey man, I'm going to go and win everything. And instead of Yamaha saying to Phil, you know, hey, you win another race and you're out. They, they didn't say that. They didn't say anything. They let him carry on. Which he thought, when he did that, he was doing right in their eyes. I see. He said that he, um, that he got um, a visit from officials of the FIM at the Bruno Grand Prix and they, they told him that it would be against the law to have a team order and that would be the reason why he had won the 250 World Championship. Yeah. Is that, it a lie? Yeah, that, that's just rubbish because the FIM would have to prove that he slowed down. That is difficult. Right? Yeah. It's impossible. Right. Right. And he said the, the worst thing is that Bill Ivey died the, the next year. That made everything worse for him. Well, he, you know that Bill <coughs> Ivey in 1968 paid for every ferry crossing from England to the continent that Phil did. Every one. Why? Phil used to just charge them, give them Bill's name and address. Send the bill here. Send the bill here. Really? Yeah. And in the end, Phil, at least Bill, said, hey, finish, man. I don't want to see the guy again. And if, you know, like Phil says, oh, they were big friends and all that. I went to a party one night, and Phil was at the party, and uh, the Paget brothers, mm -hmm. they said to me, go and get Bill. Bring him to the party. And I went to Bill's and I said to Bill, look, they want you to come to the party. And he said, is the snake there? I said, yes. He said, well, I ain't going. Mm. He said, get rid of him and I'll come. Oh, so they were big enemies. Oh, they were enemies. Mm. Do you know the uh, circumstances around the uh, fatal accident of, uh, of Bill Ivey? We heard that um, during the practice, the mechanics got out of spark plug and saw that already something was going wrong, but they they sent him out mm. on and, that uh, final The only left. thing that I heard was that he went out and it seized and his helmet came off. But I saw him before, like at the funeral, mm -hmm. and he, owned, he had a, uh, a small, like, graze on his head here. That was all? Wasn't, he wasn't... Uh, smashed up in that. I see. So... Um, for which rider did you like to work most? Which which was uh, the, the nicest human being or the nicest guy? I think... I think... Um, Kanaya was a good guy. Uh, Kenny and Mike. I think... Um, Jim was too selfish? Well, he, you know, like, he'd sort of say, you know, let's have lunch. And then when it came to pain, then it was, oh, man, I've forgotten my wallet in the hotel. <laughs> As you know damn well, he would never leave his money in the hotel. In that, you know. Um, which was the, s the saddest moment in your career? I mean, many... Uh, Many riders died during that that uh, period when you were working. But what was really the, the, the saddest moment when you were really, really uh, sad? 
I think the um, the day Saarinen was killed because um, it was a very, very strange set of circumstances. We took the, the 250 bikes to the line and the Yamaha's had a policy that only the mechanics touched the bikes before you gave them to the riders. No engineer could touch them. Really? Yeah. They said, hey, you don't touch them. Those bikes were with the mechanics and that's it. So you were the only ones who were really res responsible. If, if, if right. any screw would have been missing mm -hmm. or one cable hasn't been hanging in, mm -hmm. you were the one who were really responsible. Right. That, that was the reason. Yeah, well, it was one of the reasons. No, I see. Yeah. But we got them to the line. And there was Ferry and Vince French with Jano's bike, and I was with Conrad's bike. And everybody was on the grid. And the engineer, uh, Mizuguchi, he said to me, go and get Jano, because he hadn't arrived yet. So I went up to Jano's van. I said to him, Jano, they're waiting for you. And he said, don't worry, they will wait for me. And I walked behind him and Soily down to the line, and um, he, w he had pole position, and he wheeled his bike over that he wasn't going to do the warm-up lap, and the spectators started booing and going crazy, and then he started after the others had gone. He went off, came back, and uh, the race started good. They both had fairly good starts, not super good starts. But like after the first lap, it was Dieter Brown and two guys together. They came by. And Mizuguchi said to me, he said, man, I wonder what's going on here. Because there was nobody, there was no noise. You couldn't hear the bikes in it. And you could see black smoke from the Grand Curve. The smoke coming from Curve burning hay balls. Uh, or tires and that. Uh, so, the next thing, Kanaya rode his bike against the, the flow of the traffic down to the start and finish. And he said to Ms. Gucci, he said, hey, there's a big one. He said, I'm sure you're not dead. Really? Yeah. And Ms. Gucci said, no, you know, okay, okay. And then he said to me, take Kanaya to the first aid place and get him fixed up because he had some grazes and bruises and that. We got to the first aid place, and when we got there, I heard somebody on the PA system in the first aid place telling somebody to fire the helicopter up. It was, you know, like when they said it's serious. So, sort of, they fired the helicopter up, we went in there, and they fixed him up, we came out, and they'd shut the helicopter down. Oh. Then we knew that it was really serious. And I think like about half an hour later, we went back to the, to the truck and all that. And somebody came and said, man, yeah, he's definitely dead. And, that, and then Kanaya said he wasn't killed in the initial crash because it, looked, it seemed like Pasolini slid out, hit the guardrails and came across. And Yana hit him like T-boned him. And they fell off and went down the road. But they were lying like here, maybe here. It was the guys coming from behind yeah. that that hit them and killed them. And then they started crashing and there was like 16 bikes, I think, ended up crashing there. And then like suddenly Naito, the, the engineer, he said to, he said to us, hey, he said, what are you going to do is load all the bikes up, you know, make sure everything's in there, and we go back to the hotel. And when we got back to the hotel, I tell you what, it was like spacemen coming from outer space. Everybody was looking at us like this. And that, and that upset a lot of people. Because then suddenly they thought, man, you know, they're looking at us and you can, you know, it's normal probably that you 
look at a team in a disaster like that. And um, Mizuguchi said, hey, go to the bar and get the strongest drink that you can handle, man. And get a glass of it and drink it and we're having dinner at 8 o'clock. And we all had, drank a glass of whiskey. And then when we came down into the um, restaurant, you know, normal Italian restaurant is like cheerful and there's talking and that. We walked in, man, it went really quiet, man, and they were like this. Staring at, at you? Yeah. Do you think they, the team. they made they made any uh, com complaints or something like that? No, no. It was just that word had got around that we were one of the teams that had lost a rider. So we had like a 10 minute dinner and we were gone. Gone, man. And then the next morning there was all these press people there. Man, oh, what happened? What happened? What happened? <laughs> we weren't there, you know. Which I think was probably, you know, one of the saddest days. Was there ever one one moment during your career when you were thinking about stopping working in that in that scenery because of such an incident? No, in car racing, yes. Did I work for um, uh, the year at the end of eighty? No, at the end of sixty-eight. I, an Australian guy who I knew, he had sports cars, and he said to me, can you come over and help us sometimes? And I went over, and he was a r real good guy, a good driver, and he was killed in, in England. And then, then there was somebody else who was killed in a car. There were like three guys that I knew killed in sports cars, and, that, and then I, I, I said, no. I don't, want to, I don't want to have anything to do with cars. You know, I'd rather work on motorcycles. Um, how did you find your way to Yamaha in those days? How, how did it work? I mean, you, you left Honda? Well, Honda's told me that they were retiring from racing. And it was strange because as soon as I retired, I got a letter from Harley Davidson here in America from uh, Dick O'Brien mm -hmm. to come and work for Harley's. But the bloody British wouldn't give me a passport. Really? Yeah. So I couldn't, I couldn't take that offer. And um, uh, then, then Kel Carruthers asked me to go and work for him. Mm -hmm. And I worked for him in 1970. And, uh, and as soon as Kill said, I'm going to America, are you coming? I said, no, I want to stay in Europe. Um, like within two weeks, um, Yamaha's asked me, would you like to come and work for us? And I said, yeah. And then you went to Amsterdam to the headquarters. Yeah. Um, how was, was your time working for Giacomo? I heard that he was also a little bit strange about paying and <laughs> well, he was, he, he, he almost forgot where his hands were when there was money in his pocket, I see. you know. <laughs> he, um, and you would have to, if you said to him, hey, Giacomo, where's the money from last week? Yes, yes, don't worry, don't worry. Next week, next week, and you'd say, what's happening? Oh, yeah, next week. Well, that would be a month later. I and see. then we used to just go straight to... Yamaha's and say, hey, he's not paying us. Mm -hmm. Sort him out. And they'd say to him, you pay them tomorrow. It was there. He had the money, right? Yeah, he had the money. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, when you forget where your hands are, or you forget where your pockets are, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one uh, last question concerning the Honda 6. Did you, did you know, or do you know the, the horsepower the, the bikes had in the those days? About, I think 62 horsepower was like the... 350? No, no, the 350 was like 75. Yeah. And what was the maximum rev the riders gave the bikes? 17, 17 and a half. On oh, the, the 350? On the 350. 
and you could take the 250 to 19. And what did Mike tell you secretly? What to what uh, ref? No, he never, he never ever. He knew that hey, they, you could over rev them like 500 RPM, or so. 19.5 was the was the maximum. Yeah, you could take them to 19, but you know. I, I saw you once start that Honda Six with a hand. Is that was that the uh, normal pro uh, pro no, procedure you, in that uh, that time? No, it was just something like in like at Alster Grand Prix, the mm -hmm. paddock is just mud. Mm -hmm. So we didn't used to like pushing the bike in the mud to start. And they used to say to us, "There is where you're going to start them, and so you're not going over there on the dry to start them." And that's all sort of nonsense. So we tried one day to start them by hand, and as soon as we found you can start them, well, that was it. <laughs> so you were your own starting machine. Well, a 50 you could start by yourself without pushing it. Because mm -hmm. if you could hold the throttle, mm -hmm. put it in gear, hold the throttle, just pull on the back wheel, mm -hmm. you'd start it. <laughs> Yo, thank you very much. Mm. That was an was a interesting interview. Thank you for mm. it. And uh, we'll try to, uh, to look what you have said and write it down and give it to Gundra okay. for his magazine. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. <laughs>